Uh, welcome to Achieving Academic Success Through Student Resilience. Thank you for coming today. Today's webinar will be recorded and will be sent out uh, by, you'll receive an email follow-up tomorrow, as well as you'll be able to see the recording in the same place that you joined today. Uh, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat window, or you can ask a question directly to uh, Dr. Thomas or myself through the question panel as well that you should see on the left-hand side of the screen. Today's webinar is brought to you by Human Esources. Human Esources is a worldwide provider in the development and provision of online assessments, student success, and personal development programs. We've also just launched a free service, free resume service. You can learn more at humanesources.com. We're so pleased today to have Dr. Thomas E. Rojo Aubrey to talk about a groundbreaking model that uses scientifically proven methods to foster students' resilience and quality of life. Give you a little bit of background on Dr. Thomas. Dr. Aubrey is the Director of Behavioral Sciences, Counseling, Faculty Chair, and Professor at South Mountain Community College in Arizona. He is also an adjunct professor at Northern University Northern Arizona State University. Dr. Aubrey has his doctorate in behavioral health and is working on a second doctorate in cognitive psychology. Dr. Aubrey also serves on the Psychology Counseling Advisory Board for Grand Canyon University and the Advisory Board for Arizona Trauma Institute. He's the author of several textbooks and books which include The Resilient Learner, Thriving in College and Beyond, the Resilient Learner Thriving and Succeeding in College, The Resilient Professional, The Science of Trauma and Recovery, Unlocking the Potential for Student Success, and co-author of Transformative Care, A Trauma-Focused Approach to Caregiving. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Aubrey to today's call. And over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you for everyone who is joining us on this webinar. So I'll go ahead and go to the next slide so we can go do an overview of what we'll be considering today. So we're going to talk about, you know, the first question, and it's a very important question. Why even teach resilience and well-being, particularly in the academic setting? Um, and part of that's going to lead into the next area. Where we're going to talk about the prevalence of mental and emotional problems. And how is that when we look at the prevalence of mental and emotional problems among students that are in the university or college, uh, how is that impacting their memory? And how is that impacting as well their learning? Because uh, we'll talk about how each of these elements, well, it, whether it's emotional, mental problems, or other stressors that students are encountering in their lives is causing stress on the brain. And that how that then comes around full circle to impact their learning in the classroom. And then we're going to take a look at the positive component. Well, do we have, do we have something to counteract the stress that, that you as educators can provide to students. And so we'll take a look at academic resilience, resiliency curriculum that we've implemented in various colleges here in the state of Arizona, as well as a few outside of the state. And then we're gonna uh, then put into application uh, at least one element of that because there's a total of six elements that we teach students. At least one of that element in one exercise which then teaches students how to be more mindful by using mental flexibility. So we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide to get us started. And so we're going to just dive into why teach resilience and well-being in the educational setting. And the answer is in the pudding, because when we take a look at research, uh, one particular research by the National Students Clearinghouse, they, they followed a cohort from 2012 until 2019. And what they wanted to see is how many students have actually completed successfully in the academic setting. And it was surprising because what they found was that for a four-year private for-profit university, the successful completion rate was 37.31%. That's low. Now for a two-year public college, those are your public, you know, community colleges, um, as well as other private colleges that are two years, your associate degree level before they move on to your bachelor's at the university, the completion rate was 39.22%. Now really think about that. Uh, think about that for a second. Imagine me inviting you to 
to invest in the business. And I'm asking you to invest 20 to 40,000, even $50,000. And in return, I'm telling you, there's a possible 40, only, you only have a, well, you have a 60% chance of probably losing your money or not earning your money back. You only have a 40% opportunity per possibility of gaining your money back and then even making it in, in, in your investment, even getting gaining earnings after that. Well, my guess is that you would probably hesitate. Most of you would say, well, I would not invest twenty to $50,000 in that organization if I'm not going to gain my money back. This is what we're really asking students. Now, invest because most universities and colleges, um, it's about twenty dollars to $50,000 to get their, their bachelor's degree. And that's what we're asking them to invest. Yet we're giving them a low percentage of possibly completing successfully with their degree. Now, the question is, what's the reason why students are not completing? And we, we don't have the answer for that. Many of us may think we do, but the research really, we can't set up strategically um, a study to show this is precisely why students are not able to graduate complete successfully, at the, whether it's at the community college or university or a private college or university. But Dr. Angela Duckworth said it best, is it, there's just it, it's a it, it's it's a multifaceted component of why students are not succeeding, which includes social, emotional, and even physical well-being. So when we come up with a plan to help our students become successful, we really need to incorporate all these elements in that. And that's one of the elements that a lot of times in academic curriculums we don't we don't address the social, we don't address the emotional. Um, and many times you don't even address the physical well-being, such as exercise, eating healthy, uh, things of that nature, so that we can help our students become successful. So we're trying to target a problem, but we're missing elements in how we're helping students succeed academically. So we'll go on to the next slide. Now let's take a look at stress among students because students are experiencing a multitude of stress. They have multiple responsibilities, at least here at South Mountain Community College. And I'm sure if I opened up the conversation there at your respective institutions, you would have, you can mention a plethora of reasons why students are stressed out. But it, even here at South Mountain Community College, the population that we serve, many of the students are working full time. Many of them have families. And then they're, on top of that, they have the academic pressures that, that, you know, homework assignments, reading, et cetera. So it's, it's a lot on their plate. So that it, uh, increases their levels of stress as they're going through college. Financial difficulties. And, and at least here at South Mountain Community College, the population we serve, a lot of our students are struggling financially. Many of them are out of employment. And then there's exposure to lifetime traumatic events. When you take a look at the research, it shows that 66 to 85% of students before entering the community college or the university, 65 to 85% have experienced at least one, if not more, major traumatic stressors. And we'll talk about how that's impacting the brain in a bit, at least briefly. And then we have one out of five, the research says one out of five undergraduates are parents. Almost half of those are single mothers. So we can only imagine the amount of stress that those students are experiencing. 19% have a learning disability. And then there's a lack of English proficiency, which makes it even more challenging for them to become successful in the community college or in the university setting. Let's go on to the next slide. So on top of the stressors, that, that uh, students are experiencing. They are also experiencing emotional and mental health problems. Let's take a look at the emotional first before we dive into the mental health problems that students are experiencing. One particular survey surveyed 67,972 students. Uh, so this, because it's not a small sample, we can say this is a representative sample, a sample of our students that we're serving. 87.4% of students reported that they felt overwhelmed by all that they had to do. Now that makes sense. Not only is just, you know, for us as, as educators, 
we only see one end of the spectrum in our classroom. We see that we're giving all these assignments to our students and they're not completing the assignments. But to think about everything they have in the large spectrum of their life, if they're a single parent, if they're struggling to find a job, or if they have a full-time job and they're just trying to make, make it to a classroom because they're working overtime, uh, you can see why students are overwhelmed with everything they have to do. 70.8% uh, of students report feeling very sad. Uh, not just sad, very sad. Um, and then 65.7% of students report feeling overwhelming anxiety. Uh, now, I mean, think of the word overwhelming. It's not just I'm experiencing some level of anxiety. I'm feeling overwhelming anxiety. So that makes it very challenging for them to successfully um, complete some of the tasks that they have to do in their personal lives because of the anxiety. 55.9% uh, uh, of students report that they felt things were hopeless. And when we take a look at the, the emotion of hopelessness, that's one of the emotions that's, that's uh, a precursor to depression. So many of our students are experiencing at least one of that precursor for depression, hopelessness. And 45.1% are reporting feelings, feeling so depressed that it was difficult to function. Now, now think about, I mean, everything that our students are experiencing, and at least we can show compassion to what they're going through because if 41 or 45.1% of students are reporting that they're feeling so depressed that it's difficult for them to function. Um, it, it, at least it gives us a, an understanding of what our students are experiencing, this uh, you know pull of emotions that they're going through as they're in our classroom. And, they, and we can show compassion to what they're going through. But at least 13.3% of students seriously considered suicide. So they need our help. And it really is, these surveys are really showing that it's a cry for help and, and, and we as the educators are really the experts that need to support them as they get through their emotional experiences going through college, as well as the mental health component. Let's go to the next component. Next slide is the slide before that. We just skipped a slide. And this is their mental, mental health because for those of us that are in the field of mental health or have been in the field of mental health, they know that it, those emotions can precipitate emotional problems, uh, emotional health problems. And this is what we see. We can't say that that's the cause of emotion, but what we can say it can precipitate emotional uh, or mental health problems. And we see that when we take a look at some of the research. Prior to COVID, one in five students met the criteria for a mental health problem. But after COVID, now the research shows that three in five students actually meet the criteria for a mental health problem. So over 60% of our students in our classrooms could be experiencing a mental health problem. And Tamara, I think we have a question. We can go ahead and... I was Sorry, I was just actually letting people know where the chat window is. I know sometimes when it pops up that uh, at least you know where it is now. So feel free to enter your comments or questions. We'll hear it and respond. Thank you. Do we have a question at this point? No, it was just me. <laughs> Not yet. All right. So then now, and, and please do feel free to, to pop in questions um, as we go through this presentation. So now the question is, how is this impacting because for many educators when we take a look at well why should i teach resiliency or why should i focus on mental or emotional problems if i'm an educator that should be left to a psychologist or a mental health professional well it, it, the reason we, we need to focus on that because it's impacting your students ability to learn in your classroom so we need to address that problem and so one of the ways that i help students understand how stress because when we're talking about mental health or emotional problems that's causing stress on the brain and so going back and simplifying it and that's just not the mental health and emotional problems it's everything that students are having to deal with in their life if they're a single parent that's added stress in the, uh, that's impacting their brain if they're working full-time and then having to go school full-time that's additional stress that's impacting the brain so i help students understand how's that stress impa impacting the brain 
And so one of the examples that I give uh, students and I tell students as they're going through this, hearing this example, please relax your body because I'm not trying to traumatize anybody, but really just give you an understanding of what's happening in the body as you're being exposed to stress, whether it's mental, emotional, or social or financial stress, stressors. So I ask students, it, let's say for, for the sake of argument that I bring in a tiger at the next class, and I allow that tiger to roam around the room, and as it's roaming around the room, it's roaring. And at the same time as it's roaming and roar, roar, roaring around the room, I'm attempting to teach you the elements of the periodic table. And this is the first time you've ever heard the elements of the periodic table. And I tell everyone you're going to have a pop quiz at the end of class. And I ask students, how many of you honestly believe you would be ready for a pop quiz after t attempting to teach you the elements of the periodic table this class period while that tiger's there? And very few students will raise their hand. Occasionally I'll have a student raise their hand and they'll say, I can do it. And I joke around because I know they're joking. And it's like, well, your survival skills suck. But they actually don't because our, our bodies are not built this way. Um, our bodies are built in the first, the first priority of the brain is to survive as well as our body. So we know this, what happens in the body? Let's take a look at our digestive system. If I, the moment that I bring a tiger into the classroom, we'll go ahead and stay back into the tiger uh, slide. The moment that I bring a tiger into the classroom, what's gonna happen is that the blood that's, let's say a student had just eaten a steak, the blood that's in the digestive tract, in the stomach, it, the blood that's there uh, in the process of the, the digestive system starts to halt, come to a halt, starts to slow down, and the blood starts to flow away from the stomach into the extremities, into the legs, into my arms, uh, giving glucose to my legs to run away from the tiger or glucose to my arms to fight that tiger. That's what happens in the body. And, and other systems start to start functional system starts to shut down. You can see why if we're exposed to long periods of stress, because the digestion starts to, to, to slow down, we're not receiving the nutrients that we need to function adequately. So you can see why our health starts to deteriorate when we're experiencing chronic levels of stress. Now, this is an acute stress because I'm just bringing a tiger into the classroom, but the same thing process still happens. And the same process happens in the brain. So what happens in the brain, instead of activity that's generally needed in the neocortical areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, in order to, to memorize content, to really process the information that you as an educator are teaching. That area of the brain, the activity starts to deviate from the higher parts of the brain and starts going to the subcortical regions of the brain, the lower parts of the, of the brain. And so even with the, for example, the pre the preorbital frontal cortex, the area of the brain that allows students to focus and concentrate, if activity is not there, where you're going to see as an educator that students are distracted. And with good reason, because we're bringing a tiger into the classroom. So it makes it very challenging for students then to function at that high cognitive level so they don't have access to the part of the brain that allows them to, to think and reflect with, with, with the type of thinking, abstract thinking and critical thinking they need to learn and it impairs their memory. Now, of course, as educators, you would never bring a tiger into the classroom, but that tiger's figurative of all the stress that students are experiencing, they're bringing it into the classroom. So it may be that argument that they had with their, with their boyfriend or girlfriend or the argument they had with their mom or dad prior to coming into the classroom, or maybe they're struggling to find a job, or it may be even that traumatic exposure to stress that they experienced that we talked about anywhere from 66 to 85% of students have experienced, and that's registered in the nervous system. And it's constantly coming up when there's triggers in the environment and it's added stress uh, to the brain. And so then they're distracted in the classroom or they're finding it very challenging to have access to that higher part of the brain, abstract thinking, if they're in a math class, making it very challenging to, to learn the concepts of math or even reflective thinking because they can't self-reflect. So if they're in the philosophy class, making it very challenging, or even if you're teaching them growth and fixed mindset, they don't have access to that part of the brain, full access 
because uh, they only use, lose complete access, but full access for them to have optimal levels of the brain for them to learn in your classroom setting and then to change behaviors. So as educators, one of the things that we need to do is help our students assist them because they never learned those skills in high school. They didn't learn it possibly within their family setting. So it's our responsibility to them teach them, not because we're psychologists or not because we're mental health professionals, but because we wanna help our students become successful. And the only way we can do that is to help them gain access to that part of the brain so that they can learn within our classroom environment. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So that's where, uh, at least here at Maricopa Community College, we created an academic resiliency curriculum utilizing some of the evidence-based approaches. And we'll go ahead and go to the next slide where we, we created a model to, to teach students how to gain access to that higher parts of the brain, at least optimal access to that higher parts of the brain, despite their environment despite the challenges that they are coming, despite everything that they're bringing into your classroom setting. And so it is a, a, a six point system that we train uh, students. Most resiliency curriculum only focus on that, that last component, that purposeful self-care and revitalization. Most curriculums teach students how to eat well, how to exercise, and they expect that to be enough for students to succeed. And while it is very important, it really does, it goes against the grain and it goes against neuroscience because, and most of us have experienced that, if you've ever experienced a stressful day at work, it's impacting stress on your brain, you're losing access to that higher cortical regions of the brain, you're expending energy because you're using your sympathetic nervous system is constantly activated throughout the high, uh, your entire day at work. So at the end of the day, you're exhausted you don't have the desire to eat a healthy salad and you don't probably have the desire to go to the gym. You probably just wanna sit on the couch, watch some TV, zone out and eat some of the fatty foods, you know, some of the comfort foods because of a stressful day. So when we only teach that element, it really goes against how our biology is set up. And so we have to take into account what our biology, how our biology is set up, work with, different elements throughout the entire day. And the first element is this, the inner balance and self-regulation. So we teach students as well as professionals because we have a curriculum for professionals to teach them to do the same thing. Throughout your entire day, how do you regulate your nervous system so you're not expending all this energy? And then at the end of the day, you're so exhausted, you can't engage in some of the self-care that's important, it's vital for, for your well-being such as social engagement, you know, engaging with your family, uh, engaging in, in healthy eating and as well as exercise. Uh, once we teach them how to do the self-regulation, how to just regulate your nervous system throughout the day, then we go into the mental flexibility. How do you change your thinking? Um, and, and, and you see in the academic setting, we try to do this first before teaching them self-regulation. Um, one interesting element that we do this is the, the growth and fixed mindset, that's changing cognition. Well, it would be the same thing as me as a clinician trying to work with somebody with depression and telling them that you need to change your, your thinking. If you're depressed or if you're anxious, you need to snap out of it and get out of it. It doesn't work that way. We can't change your cognition, your way of thinking until we teach somebody self-regulation so they can gain access to a higher part of the brain that allows them to self-reflect and allows them to then move on to the next mental flexibility to change their ability to see things from a different perspective. And so once again, we're just using neuroscience to help support change or successful uh, change of behaviors that lead to success for our students. Otherwise, it makes it very challenging for us to help our students succeed if we're going against the grain of how our biology is built. After we're doing that, then we go into purpose, uh, purposeful, it, it, purpose and meaning. So we're helping students find what is your purpose and meaning and in, in not just enrolling into to the college or university setting, but what's the purpose and meaning for each of your classrooms? What's the purpose and meaning for each of your homework assignments? Because if they don't find purpose and meaning, they don't, they don't have the enthusiasm or the desire or motivation to do, to, to do the work that they need to become successful whether it's in the classroom setting or overall in the academic setting. 
Then we, we teach them positive psychological strengths. Those are the elements of positive psychology because we want to build that well-being. So we're working off of the work of Dr. Uh, Martin Seliman. How do we improve happiness? How do we improve well-being for our students so they can thrive and succeed in all areas of their life? And of course, we want to build that social component. So we teach them all the evidence-based approaches to build meaningful and purposeful relationships. So not just superficial, superficial relationships. How do they really build connection? And not just with their family, but even with their professors. And then we teach them some of the evidence-based approaches on how to communicate with their professors. And of course, then the last element is that self-care <clears throat> and revitalization. Once they've learned all these elements, they can definitely engage in that those type of practices. All right, we'll go into the next slide. So we can see it's a really a comprehensive resilience curriculum. In addition to <clears throat> the six elements that we considered, we also discussed some of the evidence-based approaches to enhancing memory and learning. These are some of the elements that have been used in the clinical setting for those that have experienced <clears throat> traumatic brain injury. We're teaching students the same elements so they can enhance their memory and learning in the classroom setting. We also teach a lot of mind hacks. So how do we, through a simple exercise, regain access to that higher parts of the brain so they can then access the higher levels of, of cognition and particularly the abstract and reflective thinking. But we also integrated mindfulness study skills. So it's not just we, we, we teach elements of a time management, for example, or self-management, as some call it. But it's not just your traditional time management. We've incorporated mindfulness to ensure that students then become a little bit more mindful and purposeful in, in, in doing these time managements. And what we've seen, at least here at Maricopa Community College, students tend to be more persistent with that because what we've seen in the past is we've taught these time management skills. Uh, one, what we've seen is that the students that need time management don't put it into practice. Just the, the ones that actually don't need it, they tend to sharpen their skills that they already have. And two, they don't persist with the skills. After the course is done, they don't follow through. And so what we've seen when we've incorporated mindfulness into study skills, as well as including time management, we see a persistence. Uh, as students start, even after the course is done, start continuing practicing the skills that they've learned. Um, and that goes into what I just discussed, the product productivity and reducing procrastination, so the time management component. And then we, we've, uh, incorporated and I've talked a lot about that we work with neuroscience we understand how the body functions so we there's we've done incorporate into this curriculum successful ways to prove that has been proven to, to modify behaviors and we've also in, incorporated academic resources for students so we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide if anyone doesn't have any questions up to now oh okay so it's not just that in many, many curriculums, they say, well, th these are the curriculum, it's amazing. And then I'm not just saying that, that the curriculum that we've in, embedded into the academic setting is amazing. We've actually assessed it. Very few academic curriculums will assess their outcomes. And so we've incorporated 18 standardized pre and post assessments to measure well-being. So not just from growth and fixed mindset, we're talking about mindfulness are we improving concentration are, are, are students able to focus better and we've incorporated total like i said 18 standardized assessments it's not something that we've created we've used assessments that have been valid uh, that have high rates of validity and reliability and you can go to this WIS website and take a look at some of the measurements of well-being that we're, we're utilizing and what, we, what we've seen is amazing results and not only have we seen students decrease as they come into high level scores of anxiety and depression, as well as other uh, measurements, we've seen improvement in just across the board with these 18 standardized assessments. So we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide. And let's go ahead and now dive in because this is what you're all waiting for is, well, what are some of the things that you're teaching? And it, it's impossible just 
for this one webinar to, to tell you everything that we're, we've incorporated into this curriculum. So I'll talk about at least one tool that we're doing. We'd consider it a mind hack because it's a way to overcome fear of math as well. So let's go and go to the next slide. But before I get into that, that tool, I want to talk a little bit about, and this is where I'm asking you to unmute yourself or type in the chat room. What are some of your methods of doing self-regulation? That's just relaxation. How do you relax your body? Or you can even answer, what are some ways students um, relax their body at your university or college? We have an answer of yoga. Yoga, great one. I know for me, it's usually like listening to music. That oh. always helps, <laughs> depending on the type. <laughs> Anything else? Sports and workouts. Sports and workouts, absolutely. Yeah. All right, could, could continue responding. Maybe some of some of you are on the webinar. Well, I don't have a way to, to, to do self-care or relax my body. That's why I'm on this webinar. So you're probably telling me, please, Dr. Avery, move on so we can learn. <laughs> so the next slide. <laughs> you bet. We do have someone who said listening to music while bathing in the tub with candles. <laughs> oh, love it. Let's go on to the next slide. You bet. And so it, with uh, listening to music while bathing with candles and yoga and sports, well, those are all excellent methods of relaxing the body. And I encourage you to continue using that. The problem is that they're not practical. And here's what I mean by they're not practical. Just imagine for a second, I'm having an argument with my boss. And in the middle of the conversation, I know I need to relax because I'm feeling tensed. I tell my boss, hold on one second. I start doing a yoga pose. Or um, I start, you know, um, hold on one second. Let me, let me go. I, I definitely probably would not want to bait in front of my boss. <laughs> so they're not practical. And it's the same thing. Your students are, are, are anxious. Um, they're experiencing, for example, test anxiety. Well, those are great ways. And by all means, I encourage students to continue. Practice yoga, practice deep, you know, pranayama from yoga, some deep breathing exercises. But you need to learn some skills there in the moment to be to some practical that, that don't interrupt what you're doing in the moment. In fact, right now, because I'm not, I, I don't consider myself, I get very anxious with, with presentations, so I'm doing them now as we're speaking. But I don't need to take a long pause and say, hold on one second, you guys, I'm feeling my body's tensing up, so I need to do some breathe, deep breathing exercises. Give me one second, and I'm all. While that is helpful, it's intrusive into what I'm doing in the moment. And I realized after my 20 years of practice, that was one of the problems that, you know, I would give some of my patients that I was treating and walk them through these amazing techniques, some of them that you find in, for those of you that practice yoga and pranayama. And I would teach uh, clients or patients the same techniques and I tell them practice that five times a day. It's all I'm asking is five times a day. And then the following week when they came back and I asked them, tell me a little bit about the exercise, the breathing exercise that you practice throughout the week. Guess how many actually practice that? And if you're thinking very little, probably one or two, you're absolutely right. And it's the same thing with our students. And so I had to put myself in their, in their shoes. Why aren't they practicing? Well, they many times, and this includes, it was definitely my, my clients and patients that I was treating with, but definitely our students as well. They live chaotic lives. They live stressful lives. They have a lot going on for them. And for them to, I have to think about, looking for work or I just lost my my job and you're asking me to remember to breathe right now in that moment well you know you and I know that that would be the best thing they can do in that moment but they've lost ask, access to that higher part of the brain so they won't remember that in that moment in their life which is constant in their life so I realized I had to come up with some self-regulation skills that they can use that doesn't interrupt they don't they can continue doing what they're doing and they can do it in real time as they're encountering these moments 
and it's so it's practical and it gives them an uh, moments of opportunity of growth. We'll talk about those moments of opportunity of growth in a bet. And so we'll go to the next slide. And this is just, um, and we'll get to that in a bit, but these exercises will help balance the nervous system because if we don't find balance within the nervous system, when we're talking about balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic nervous system is that part of the nervous system that relaxes you. So if we find balance there, then the body can start regaining access to those functional systems, such as digestion, such as higher levels of thinking. But if we don't find balance, then our bodies are off balance. When we lose access to those, whether it's the digestion, whether it's the immune system, and so now we're, because we're stressed out, we have addition, higher levels of colds. We have other sicknesses and illnesses because of stress, because our immune system is shot because of stress, or whether we're just not getting the nutrients that we need because now we're losing less function, optimal functioning in the digestive system because of the stress that we're experiencing, or whether it's the learning that we're talking about in the classroom, memory. So we're not having access to the higher parts of the brain. So we need to help our sins balance their nervous system. And so one skill that's, that's practical, it's not intrusive, is a very simple skill. It's, it, we call this the body scan, or some of us call it the wet noodle. And you'll see why we call it the wet noodle. But it's a simple exercise, and you can do this now. You don't have to close your eyes. Like I said, I'm doing this right now as we're speaking. And all you need to do is just scan your body from head to toe or from toe to head, whatever your preference is, and just notice any tense muscles in your body. Now, this is important because when the sympathetic nervous system becomes activated, think about the last time you were stressed. What happens to your muscles? They tense up. So your muscles are a good indication that you have an activated nervous system. Your muscles shouldn't be tensed unless you're calling them purposefully to you, such as doing push-ups. Well, then in that case, your muscles should be tensed. But if otherwise, there's no absolutely no reason for your muscles to be tensed. So if your muscles are tense, whether it's at the conscious or unconscious level, you're experiencing some level of stress. And that's why your muscles is tense because now the sympathetic nervous system is being activated. So this is, this is and that's the mindfulness component, kind of coming to a realization I'm noticing in my body have tension. Maybe for some of us, we have tension between the eyebrow or maybe tension in the face. Or maybe some of us experience a lot of tension in the neck or the shoulders. So as you're doing this body scan, you start from the head, you're noticing your your top of your crown of your head. Is there any tension there or between the eyebrows? And just intentionally, deliberately loosen those areas. But you're the one that's squeezing those areas. Nobody else is squeezing them. It may take some practice, but with time, you can unsqueeze those areas. And then keep on going down as you notice, is there any tension in the cheek area, the cheekbones? Any tension in the neck? Loosen those. Any tension in the shoulders? We'll drop the shoulders, loosen them. And you can all you can continue doing this, the chest area, the abdomen, the torso. You can continue doing that and just noticing any tension. Are there tension in the thighs? Are there tension in the shins? How about the feet? Just loosen them. Loosen the toes. And you can do this with your eyes open. So you can have students practice this as they're taking an exam. They don't have to close their eyes. They just loosen their body. And it's enough just to, it's not deep relaxation, such as some of the yoga or some of the deep relaxation, but it's enough to just balance the nervous system to allow students to regain access to the, to the higher parts of the brain or maybe re-engage the digestive system or the, the immune system. And if they're constantly doing this, they're increasing their well-being. So let's go into the next slide. And so here's what we do utilizing this skill that we just, we just train students to do. We ask students 
to write a list of stressors. And this is gonna be an activity that we do to build their resilience, just like weight training, weightlifting, or even if you're doing a marathon, you need to increase your, your, your stamina or you need to increase your strength to start lifting heavier weights. The same thing too, we need, we're working with students to build the resilience to deal with more levels of stress or higher levels of stress. So we ask students to write a list of stressors on a piece of paper. And this is, this is something you're gonna start working on. And, and then we ask students, that list of stressors, we want you to scale them on a scale of one to 10. So a Likert scale, simple, one to 10 or one to three, whatever you prefer. Scale them, uh, five being the highest. This means this is a level of stress that's just triggering. It's overwhelming. I can't manage. I can't deal with it. And we tell students, do not, do not. And we emphasize that. Do not engage in those stressors. Do not, no need. Just leave it on the list and explain to students the reason why we're asking you to not engage in those stressors is because if, if you've never ran a marathon and then I ask you to run five miles and you've never ran before you're well, you probably don't have the stamina and you may even, it may be painful. You may be coughing up a lung, trying to run five miles, pushing yourself to the limit. You may strain yourself. Same thing with weightlifting. If you never weightlifted and I ask you to, to bench 350 pounds, you may injure yourself. And it's the same thing too. If we address those high levels of stressors, what we're going to do is for some of our students, we're going to re-traumatize them. And so we do not want to do that. So it's an emphasize, do not focus on those stressors. Let's focus on the ones. And then we'll jump to the twos. The ones may be, for example, I get stressed out when I'm driving the car, uh, driving in the car and, we, and I'm stuck in traffic. Or it may be I get stressed out when I have to think about my doing my math. Whatever the case may be, those are the ones that you're, those ones are the ones you're going to be working with. What we ask students to do is pair that stressor, every time you encounter that stressor, I want you to do a, re, a, a relax your, your nervous system. Maybe the body scan that we talk, talk to you, spoke about just earlier, or it can be a deep relaxation skill if it's practical, because I don't want you as you're driving the car to start doing yoga poses and then you have an accident. So you might do a practical or a deep relaxation exercise, but whatever you need to do is that every time you're activated, that's a sympathetic nervous system, you need to start engage in the parasympathetic nervous system with a relaxation skill. Here's what's happening in the body because you're doing it every single time. Every time you encounter a stressor, let's say a student is students fearful of math. Every time they think about math or have a homework assignment about math, they, their sympathetic nervous system becomes activated. And then that sympathetic nervous system activates their fight or flight response. So this is why students fail to they procrastinate. They don't do their homework assignment because they're fleeing from it or they're fighting uh, the advisor. Why do I have to do math? I'm going to become a police officer. So why do I have to take this math class or I want to become a, a counselor? So why do I have to take this level of math? So they're fighting it because their sympathetic nervous system is activated. Now, every time they come into the math class and they're activated because now they're stressed out because their instructor's teaching uh, something that, that they just don't grasp, they can't learn. Now their sympathetic nervous system becomes activated, losing higher parts of the brain. Every time they keep continue doing that, pairing the sympathetic nervous system with, with the concept of math, they're strengthening that neural connection between the concept of math and stress or the sympathetic nervous system. Math, sympathetic nervous system, math, sympathetic nervous system. Here's what we're doing. We're doing reverse engineering. Now we're asking students to do Every time you encounter math, every time you think about math, every time you do math, every time you sit in a classroom in math, now you're saying math, relax, parasympathetic nervous system. Math, relax, parasympathetic nervous system. Math, relax, parasympathetic nervous system. What fires together, wires together, meaning that that old neural pathway to stress starts to wither away and new neural pathways start to develop. And eventually, if you continue doing this long enough, you start sitting in the math class and say, I don't know why I was so stressed out with math. Because now that you have new neural pathways developing, you start to heal students' past traumatic experiences with a simple mind hack. And we've seen this with students. We had one particular student who came and registered in one of, uh, one of our resiliency classes. 
Uh, she had taken a college success prior to that and still failed her math class. She had failed her math class three times. And then they recommended her to take a college success course and still failed the math class. And then someone recommended to her to take a resiliency class, took this class. I had her do that same simple technique. What would happen is that midterm final, she would freeze. She could not answer any of the questions on the exam, she would just freeze. And at the end of the class, she would turn in her class with not a single response on the, on the exam. So she would obviously fail her classes. She started doing this technique, healing. We didn't have to sit on my couch. We didn't have to talk about what are some of the experiences she encountered in grade school with math. We didn't have to talk about any of that. We were just pairing that. Came midterm. She came ecstatically after midterm. Dr. Aubrey, Dr. Aubrey, you'd be amazed. I actually started answering questions. I got a, I got, you know, she, she, a couple of days later, she said she got a, a C in the exam, but it's better than an F because I didn't answer any questions. So she was healing. She wind up passing the class with just a simple technique, which we call a mind hack because we're rewiring the brain. All right, we'll go to the next one. And that's, that's what we call bottom-up regulation. It's techniques that we've used, um, evidence-based approaches we've used to heal from trauma, to heal from uh, even, it doesn't even have to be some of the major traumatic events. I, I, we've improved relationships with this skill. Um, so we've had, I had years ago, I had a police officer that came into my office and wanted to improve his marriage. And he said he would get triggered and stressed out every time he saw his wife. And I said, you know, he said there was times he talked about, I just, I can't even sit with her anymore. And it's just getting worse and worse. And I don't want to feel like that with my wife. And I don't know why. And I just had her, every time you see your wife, what do you think about every time you think about your wife, I just want you to do a body scan, scan your body and loosen it or any other deep relaxation skill if you want, or some of the acute relaxation skills that we learn besides the, the body scan and do it every single time. Same thing happened, same concept we did with the, with, with, with the math, the student that was fearful of math. And he was over, able to overcome his anxiety and stress with his wife and was able to engage with his wife in conversations without getting stressed out. So. It has a multitude of areas that, you know, areas that we can apply this, but we can definitely apply it in the academic setting. So let's go to the next slide. So I want to leave at least about 10 minutes, and I think we have about 10, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. But um, so I just want to leave you my contact for, for information. You're always welcome to reach out if you have any questions. Please write this down. Or if you want to learn more about the curriculum, uh, we're working on an, a newer edition of the curriculum where we've Im embedded even nutrition. So how do we use nutrition to enhance well-being for our students? So, but you can reach out to Carla and there's her email right there. And I believe she's on the conference with us as well. Great. Thank you very much, Thomas, for all this uh, great information. I know it's always great to receive stuff that you can get started on and use either yourself uh, or in the classroom, <laughs> ideally both. And so thank everybody for, for coming today. If you have any questions, please uh, put them in the questions window uh, for private or in the chat window and Dr. Aubrey's happy to uh, answer them. Just a reminder that uh, everybody will receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will have uh, the information we talked about today, as well as a, a reminder of how to access the recording. If you log into the same location, you will see the recording will be available. Instead of enter session, it will say view recorded webinar, and you'll be able to access it that way. There will be a short survey that you should receive right after the webinar. And uh, if you mind taking a few minutes um, as a uh, as education professionals, I'm sure you all know how important that feedback is. And that would be great. So we'll just give it a couple minutes here and see if anybody has any questions. I know everybody's busy with their their days, but. Yeah, it's even whether it's questions of it's 
how do you applicability to other areas? You know, because I described its applicability to math. Um, and this is just one of hundreds of tools that you will gain. Uh, but you can see that the, the, these are tools beyond, and you know, what we've traditionally used in the academic setting. So it's, you know, it, we're, we're going into a new era where we really need to support st uh, students at all levels, at their emotional level, at their, their uh, so that they can become successful in the academic setting. So it's going to take <laughs> an open mind uh, to, to utilize, but these are, these are tools that anyone can use. You don't have to be licensed. You know, you can, you can apply these, there's tools and we'll, I mean, definitely Tamara will mention there's tools that will apply and how do we, you know, do mindfulness in the classroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, such essential skills for students and for everybody to have, to know how to deal with these stressors. Um, you know, just reading the news these days is, is enough for a lot of people to uh, to stress us out a bit. <laughs> I don't see any questions. So at this point, I will thank everybody for their time. And I hope you have a fabulous day. Thanks again, Dr. Aubrey, for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you for inviting me. I look forward to our next webinar. You bet. And we, as a reminder, we do have one webinar that is available tomorrow. If you're able to join us, it will be focused on career success. Thank you so much. Have a great day.